I'm pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar. My name is Michael Collins, and I am the Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs here in Dublin. We're delighted to be joined today by Mara Sefcovic, the Vice President of the European Commission for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, and most importantly for today's purposes, Co-Chair of the EU-UK Joint Committee and Partnership Council. Very pleased to welcome the Commissioner back to Dublin. He was here previously in 2012, this time virtually, of course, and of course, an awful lot has changed in the meantime. I think it's fair to say that we could hardly have a more relevant speaker at this time at the Institute. We are again at a critical juncture on issues surrounding the Northern Ireland Protocol, issues of enormous importance uh, to relations on and between these islands and between the UK and the Europe its European neighbours. Vice President uh, represents the interests of the European Union and, of course, Ireland in navigating a way forward and in finding solutions to some very sensitive and tricky issues. Vice President Shevswich will speak to us for about 20 minutes and then we will go to the Q&A session with you, our audience. You'll be able to join the discussion in the usual way using the Q&A function on Zoom, which I think is now familiar to everybody. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you and we will come to them once the Vice President has finished his presentation. A reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record, and please do feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. By way of further background, uh, prior to taking on his current responsibilities, from 2010 to 2019, uh, uh, Vice President Shevkovich was Vice President of the European Commission responsible for inter-institutional relations and administration, and subsequently the Energy Union. Prior to this, he served as Commissioner for Education, Training, Culture and Youth. He previously served as a member of the Slovak Diplomatic Corps in Zimbabwe and Canada, as Ambassador to Israel, and as Permanent Representative to the EU. Vice President Shevkovich holds a PhD in European Law from Comenius University in Bratislava. Vice President, Commissioner, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much once again for your kind invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, As you see, I'm learning, uh, learning Irish now because I think I need it uh, in my, in my uh, very frequent contacts with Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland. And I really would like to uh, thank you, dear Michael and dear Andrew, for your kind invitation, also for reminding us how the time is indeed flying. I, I thought that it was yesterday, and it just reminded me that it was really a couple of years ago when I visited uh, that time, of course, physically, uh, your prestigious uh, uh, institute. Because I know uh, that uh, the Institute of International and uh, European Affairs plays extremely important role in, deba in debating European democracy, and therefore, I very much appreciate your invitation and indeed uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be talking to you and uh, to your audience uh, uh, this morning. If you allow me, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start uh, with one thing that uh, sometimes gets lost uh, in uh, the debate uh, around uh, Brexit. Uh, and this is the depth of support uh, uh, for the European Union in Ireland, which is indeed very, very impressive. A recent uh, uh, Red Sea opinion poll found that over 80% of Irish adults believe Ireland should remain a member of the European Union. And I think that this is uh, no surprise to me because I visited your beautiful country many times. And I'm also coming from a small member state myself. And uh, I know the enormous advantages the EU membership uh, can bring. Not at least uh, it's like uh, being in uh, the family because when a family member is in trouble, the whole clan is there to help. And that is uh, why the EU has shown such a strong solidarity with Ireland uh, over past uh, uh, few years uh, as it has faced up to the reality of Brexit. This support has come in uh, many ways, uh, not least financially, as uh, Ireland is by far the most affected member state uh, in the EU. As you know, just one example, the council recently approved uh, the 5 billion euros of uh, Brexit adjustment reserve. And this will, uh, this will support the regions, the sectors, the communities hit hardest uh, 
by uh, Brexit. And Ireland will benefit the most from this fund receiving over 1 billion euros. But as we all know, um, it's not all about the money. Ever since uh, the outcome of the Brexit referendum back in uh, 2016, it has been clear to us that protecting peace and stability on the island of Ireland must be our number one priority. And that is exactly what it has become. As you know, the EU has an unbreakable commitment to the people uh, of Northern Ireland and across the island of Ireland. We have spared no effort to ensure that the peace, stability and prosperity uh, they have enjoyed over the last uh, 20 years uh, is preserved. After all, the EU is a peace project itself. That is why we are continuing to support the Peace Plus program together with the UK and the Irish government, which amounts uh, to around uh, 1 billion euros as well. But that's not all. We are also working hard to overcome of the difficulties that the people and businesses in Northern Ireland are experiencing regarding the implementation uh, of the protocol. Before I turn into details, let me highlight the underlying points which we uh, sometimes lose the sight of as well. The European Union's overall objective is to establish positive and stable relationship with the United Kingdom. Despite uh, the recent difficulties, we remain partners with shared values faced with the same global challenges such as climate emergency. Our relationship is now based on two agreements, the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement. The UK government negotiated, agreed and signed both these agreements, including the uh, protocol on uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland, the subject of uh, today's discussion. And as you know very well, the UK Parliament ratified all these agreements just uh, uh, not that many months ago. Having exercised, uh, having exercised its sovereign right to enter into uh, such international agreements, uh, the UK government now carries the responsibility of respecting them. This is all the more important given how difficult it was uh, uh, to reach agreement. It took countless hours of intense line by line negotiations, but eventually we achieved what the times uh, seemed impossible, ensuring the UK's orderly withdrawal from the EU and establishing the foundations of the new ambitious relationship uh, between two strong partners. Without any shadow of a doubt, reaching consensus on Northern Ireland was the most challenging part of those negotiations. Together, uh, though, we did find a solution. The protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. As you know well, it serves the number of purposes. It protects the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all its parts, respects the constitutional order of the United Kingdom, avoids the hard border on the island of um, Ireland, and preserves the integrity of the EU single market while ensuring that the UK as a whole leaves both the single market and the EU's custom union, a key demand of uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson. This solution was shaped, agreed and approved together by both sides. We therefore also share responsibility for making it work on the ground. On the UK side, it agreed that the EU rules on ground, uh, the EU rules on uh, goods uh, would remain applicable to Northern Ireland. And in doing so, it accepted that, it, uh, that this would mean checks on goods moving between Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland, acknowledging a role for the EU institutions. This is uh, the only way to avoid the hard border between North and South. On the EU side, we agreed uh, that the UK would uh, carry out those checks and controls on our, on our behalf. An unprecedented gesture, I'm sure you would agree. No other jurisdiction uh, in the world had done this before. This solution required compromise. Everyone around the table understood uh, 
what these compromises meant in practice. And the implementation of this agreement will continue to require compromise from both sides. Our overarching priority throughout this process has been the people of Northern Ireland. Regardless uh, uh, of uh, the identity or political outlook, and of course, the protection of the peace process. We also have a duty towards our uh, consumers to ensure that there are no risks from products imported from the country with different health and safety standards. While the negotiations were difficult, the outcome now presents a real opportunity for Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland. This was one of my key messages when I was in Northern Ireland recently. The exchanges I had uh, uh, during my visit only strengthened my conviction of the enormous benefits on offer to Northern Ireland. In particular, its unparalleled access to two of the world's largest market with more than 500 million consumers can be a powerful magnet for foreign investments translated into jobs and growth. As one of the business leaders I met in Northern Ireland put it, you can have jam on both sides of your bread. That's uh, uh, certainly one way to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Northern Ireland can trade freely with the EU without having to pay uh, for this unique access uh, to our single market. And I know uh, that the business community in Northern Ireland and across the island of Ireland is keen to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm sure that border uh, communities are equally as positive about its potential. That's why I have uh, raised uh, the idea of uh, investment conferences to install the confidence in uh, business community in Northern Ireland and to pave the way for further opportunity. We are already seeing a significant number of investment inquiries, especially from the United States, Canada, and the EU. But if uh, we are to turn this opportunity into reality, the protocol must be properly implemented. Over the past month, my colleagues in the EU and I have made every effort to respond to outstanding problems with creative and uh, solid new solutions. But the spirit of compromise needs to be a mutual one, as our responsibility is also a shared one. The protocol is not the problem. On the contrary, it is the only solution we have. Failing uh, to apply it will not make problems disappear, but simply take away the tools to solve them. Simply opposing the protocol without providing real solutions won't make the problems go away either. Rather, we are seeking solutions that work for all, including those opposed to the protocol. The EU has already tabled and adopted several practical uh, solutions to overcome the difficulties felt uh, on the ground. Most recently, on the 30th of June, the Commission put forward a package of measures, including our commitment to change uh, our own uh, rules to ensure the long-term supply of medicine from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. But I also need to be honest. While we will continue looking for solutions to minimize the effects of uh, Brexit on everyday lives, we will never be able to remove them entirely. Such are the consequences of Brexit and the choices made uh, by the UK government. The key question now, of course, is where we go from here. As you know, the UK published a common paper on the 21st uh, of July, and uh, we have been engaging intensively with our UK partners uh, ever since. I believe that our focus should be on those issues that matter most to the people of Northern Ireland and their everyday life. In Belfast, I listened to stakeholders and uh, emphasize uh, the need to facilitate east-west trade. That means long-term solution in the food and plant safety, or as we call it, SPS area. I heard businesses ask for further trade facilitations in the area of customs. 
And I also heard a lot about the need for Northern Irish political institutions and other stakeholders to be properly heard. One issue of vital importance to me echoed uh, throughout my visit is finding a solution for the continued supply of medicines to Northern Ireland, including generics. This way, medicines provided under the NHS, for example, can continue to move into Northern Ireland without any hindrance. This is a complicated area, and we are double, or I would even say triple checking with the UK authorities, as well as the pharmaceutical companies themselves to ensure that our approach is indeed watertight. I remain convinced that our focus must remain on these areas. We cannot uh, afford to think short-term either. We need long-lasting solutions to provide predictability, stability and certainty in the Northern Ireland. For this effort to be successful, however, it must be done together with our UK partners. Joint engagement for shared solutions. But let me also be clear about what we will not do. We will not renegotiate the protocol as the UK is requesting. And we will not accept solutions which would effectively mean cutting Northern Ireland off from the EU single market and related uh, opportunities. Finally, allow me to touch on Article 16. A lot has been said uh, by the UK politicians about the possibility of uh, the UK triggering Article 16. I do not think that uh, this has been helped. It distracts us from working together uh, to find solutions, and it would not help us find uh, solutions any quicker. After all, it has taken us five long years to get where we are today. So it is clear that there are no quick, easy fix solutions uh, to what is an extremely complex uh, situation. But uh, I want to close by underlying the positive. I believe that uh, we can find practical solutions to help ensure that the protocol works well on the ground across Northern Ireland and Ireland in urban and rural areas alike. And if uh, the protocol is functioning well in Northern Ireland, uh, it will uh, also be uh, bef uh, to the benefit of all on both sides of the Irish Sea and across the channel. And here, if you allow me, I would conclude my introductory remarks. I would once again thank you for your uh, kind invitation, for your attention, and I am looking forward to what I'm sure will be a lively discussion. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, thank you, uh, Vice President. Indeed, that was that was wonderfully um, uh, full presentation of the, of the current situation. And uh, just invite people to please let us have your questions. We get to as many as we can. I suspect we won't be able to get to them all. If we can't get them to, to them individually, hopefully we will cover we'll cover them thematically and get the commissioners, um, the Vice President's views uh, to the greatest extent possible. But if I could just start off maybe by getting the ball rolling, um, if I may, Vice President. Um, you, you, you rightly ended on a positive note, an optimistic note, although at times I'm sure it's quite difficult to be optimistic and positive, but how serious uh, would you rate uh, the current impasse over the Northern Ireland Protocol? Michael, can you, can you uh, repeat the last part? How serious I would... How, would how, serious, how serious do you consider the current impasse over the Northern Ireland Protocol is? Uh, I think that uh, uh, if you look at it uh, through the lenses uh, of uh, practical solutions, uh, I, I'm really convinced uh, that to most uh, of uh, uh, the issues which have been brought up in my really uh, extensive, very, very, very cordial, and I have to say very warm discussions I had in uh, Northern Ireland. We, we spent a lot of time with the representatives of the business community. We had uh, a very sincere discussion with the, with the civic society, and I had an honor and a pleasure to talk in Stormont with all leaders of all political parties. I met the first minister and representatives of the first uh, the deputy minister. And as you can imagine, I would say that the, 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 the questions uh, being uh, kind of raised uh, 
uh, maybe with a different intensity, but uh, very often that being the, the same sectors and the same group of the problems which we need to tackle on the practical level. And I'm sure that if you would focus on what needs to be done uh, concretely uh, for the people uh, in, uh, in the Northern uh, Ireland and uh, kind of turn the page and start to develop uh, all those opportunities I was referring to, and uh, I can give you many more examples which have been presented, uh, uh, <clears throat> especially by the uh, business uh, uh, representatives. So then I think uh, that we would be, we would be uh, in the uh, right direction. And I believe that we have good answers to, to all these questions. But if uh, we would be here uh, to reopen everything what we've been discussing over the last uh, five years, role of EU institutions, uh, uh, access of Northern Ireland uh, to, to, to single market, and uh, uh, you know all the basic questions to which we've been uh, looking uh, for the answers for that many years. So then, of course, I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a big problem. But I think that our task uh, uh, with the Lord Frost especially is to look for the solutions. And therefore, I can tell you, <clears throat> we are working very intensely um, uh, within uh, the EU institutions, with our member states, with the parliament. We are, of course, in very close contact uh, uh, with uh, the, the Irish government. And I would say uh, that we are in permanent touch with our UK counterparts, because I think that we know how to solve these problems. Not all of them, but the most troubling ones we, we clearly can do. So what we need is also to have a political will uh, from from uh, other side to uh, roll sleeves up, focus on the, on the practical problems, and I believe that we can we can solve them. If we push it into the, another dimension, some kind of reopening of the issues which we all hope to be closed with these both agreements and understanding, so then 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 we have a then we have a, uh, a problem, and uh, then we are hitting on the on the walls, uh, uh, which will be very difficult to to overcome. So therefore. Uh, we want uh, to make sure that uh, that we will complete finalize our work uh, by the by the mid of the of the next week and to clearly demonstrate that to all the uh, more most recurring problems uh, which I heard about when I was visiting Northern Ireland, we have a good solutions and and I hope uh, that uh, then we can uh, work very well uh, with the, with the, with the Lord uh, Frost and other stakeholders uh, to push it into the more more positive territory. Yeah, you, you, you the Commission seems to be very much focused on practical solutions, offering practical solutions to some of these issues. You cited in particular um, medicines issue. Just would you be concerned, or to what extent would you be concerned that the issue has gone beyond the practical and become politicized to to the point where? practical solutions may be just uh, not sufficient for, 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 for people who are opposing the protocol? I think that uh, first and foremost, we have to, of course, listen um, uh, to the people in Northern Ireland. And I, I, and I can tell you, uh, despite uh, what, is, what I understand uh, is uh, charged uh, political atmosphere in Northern Ireland, that when I was uh, talking uh, to the, as I said, uh, representatives of uh, uh, different circles in 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 the Northern Ireland. Uh, 90 90 percent of uh, of all the questions and problems which been presented uh, to me been practical, practical. I mean, practical for, for traders, practical for uh, for farmers, uh, practical uh, for the people who explained to me just do the business. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, NGB and 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 vice uh, vice versa. A lot of uh, uh, you know getting used to the the, the, the new system, and I believe that uh, if we demonstrate that we can we can solve these problems and we do it in a good faith and in a, in a good will, that it will have of course a, a positive uh, um, a positive repercussion on um, also all those uh, who are who are opposed to, to the uh, protocol. Because I think that first uh, and foremost, the opposition. Was generated because they felt that the protocol might represent more obstacles and opportunities. And I think it's 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 our duty uh, to to highlight uh, the fact that uh, we can develop further their opportunities and uh, and reduce uh, reduce the, the the obstacles. And of course, I heard those who are opposing the protocol, but I heard uh, also those, and there've been quite quite many of them, who want uh, 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 the protocol to be properly implemented and to actually 
tap into that huge potential which uh, free access, free access, just ask the, 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 the Norwegian what it means. Free access, hustle-free trading, the biggest trading block in the, in the world, what it, what it represents uh, for Northern Ireland. How many jobs, how many business opportunities, how many uh, new, new type of uh, logistics, uh, distribution hubs, and uh, how many opportunities it, it uh, represents for Northern Ireland. So I, so I hope that uh, we would be focusing on uh, what is important? Uh, what is important um, uh, for the people of the Northern Ireland, and I hope that we will make a pretty strong case uh, that it's much better uh, uh, to work uh, clearly within the protocol, being aware and being able to solve the outstanding practical practical issues. And I hope that it will also uh, uh, be the 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 good contribution to calm down what is sometimes politically very charged. Uh, 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 discussion uh, uh, in Northern Ireland. Okay, I'm just going to take a few questions then, if I may, from uh, from our audience. Um, I will probably go, probably be a little bit of repetition here as we're going along, but please uh, bear with me. A question here from Brian Dobson, who's a presenter of Irish uh, Radio News at lunchtime, the RT News at one, and he wants to know, uh, what would it take for the EU to reduce some of the checks on GB goods going into, nor into the north, and the vice president indicated that there would need to be compromise on both sides. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, it's a very relevant question and uh, that's uh, one area upon which we are really focusing a lot right now. First and foremost, uh, I think everybody would agree with me that uh, uh, if you are talking about the, the integrity uh, of the European single market, we of course, uh, uh, we have to know uh, what is coming in and what is coming out. And as I said, we kind of delegated uh, uh, this power to control, to check uh, uh, to, to UK and uh, uh, to kind of push it up another uh, level. Uh, what we would need would be real-time access uh, to the IT databases. And uh, we are discussing this uh, since I would say uh, the, the summer, not of this year, but of the, of the last year. And I have to say uh, that I think it was last week uh, I received additional information from the, from the Lord Frost, uh, where it's uh, uh, more clearly spelled uh, how the IT architecture is being built, uh, what is the, the access which will be granted to, uh, uh, to our experts. And I think that step by step, slowly, gradually, we are getting uh, where we need to be. And, and of course, our final destination is what is uh, agreed between us from the outset that we would have real-time access uh, uh, to uh, the IT database if it, if it comes uh, uh, to, the, to the goods and, 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 and customs. And of course, one, one, uh, that is done and it would have a much better overview of what is uh, uh, happening on the border. Then of course, we are ready to look creatively on uh, uh, what can we do uh, with the checks? Uh, uh, how can we reduce uh, the numbers and preserve, I would say, the same quality and, uh, and at the same level uh, of the information we need. So we are ready to look at it. Uh, uh, more data uh, we, we've got, easier it would be for us, and we are looking for different options how this can be done. Yeah, and you mentioned, I think there is an expectation that the uh, the commission will next week produce maybe a response, uh, its response to the command paper. We have a question here from Shona Murray, who is the Europe uh, correspondent with Euronews. And uh, particularly she wants to know when the EU announces its details on softening the Northern Ireland protocol in coming days, how can you be sure that the UK government won't simply bank these uh, derogations and continue its threat to trigger Article 16. I think that's uh, that's that's very uh, that's very relevant question, and I, I have to say that uh, I get this question a lot also from uh, from our member states and uh, from our uh, members of the European Parliament, and uh, uh, and I, I can tell you that uh, that I carry a certain political risk in working on uh, what I described the very solid. Uh, set of uh, uh, practical solutions to do the problems we, uh, we heard uh, uh, so much about uh, uh, when I was in, uh, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, because indeed, 
I can tell you that we are looking at every uh, possible opportunity inside out what we can, what we can do in these four concrete areas uh, I mentioned. I mean, the SPS, uh, customs, uh, uh, medicine supplies, but also making sure that Northern Irish representatives are, uh, have a, uh, are properly heard uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the EU. So we are looking on all the uh, opportunities and, and, and all, the, all, the, all the avenues. And I think uh, that uh, what we uh, are uh, discussing right now and uh, uh, where we would like to put the final touches, uh, hopefully by the, by the uh, mid of uh, next week, that it's very sincere proposal, but uh, from, from uh, our, our perspective, uh, this would be really, uh, I would say very far uh, reaching uh, proposals. And, uh, I sincerely hope that it will be seen uh, as such uh, by our uh, UK counterparts and uh, they, they engage constructively uh, in uh, our discussion because uh, uh, I think uh, we have to kind of move uh, from the tough uh, political, political rhetoric, from the, from the, from the threats uh, uh, we hear all the time, uh, down to the business to actually solve the problems we we, uh, we heard uh, a lot about uh, from Northern Ireland and and I'm absolutely convinced that that the Article 16 is is definitely not uh, something which helps uh, in that respect because it it uh, uh, brings the relevant questions. You are trying to do your uh, your most and what you hear from the other side is it's not good enough. Bring more and you know uh, the, the the material. Uh, grounds for Article uh, uh, 16 are there, so we could we could trigger any time we want. I mean, these threats are not definitely helping uh, uh, to uh, present and work on the on the, on the good uh, good proposals. But uh, we want uh, simply to make sure that from our side we will demonstrate to people of Northern Ireland, to the people of Ireland, uh, that we in the European Commission are ready to do everything what is possible within the, the framework which we just uh, agreed and uh, ratified for, to solve the practical issues which are on the table. That we want the Northern Ireland uh, to benefit uh, from the access to the biggest uh, trading block in the world. That we want to make sure that there will be no hard border and that we contribute by this uh, future uh, prosperity of uh, Northern Irish uh, uh, economy to the, the peace and uh, stability uh, as it is uh, clearly uh, underlined, underscored, and enshrined in a, in a Good Friday Agreement. That's, that's our proposal. We will put it on the table, and if for some other reasons, and I, I'm not going to, to speculate what they might be, this is rejected, then indeed uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have a problem. We have a problem, but I hope that we will, we will avoid it because uh, we are approaching uh, this uh, from, the, from, the, from the beginning, uh, in, in a good phase, and we want to be problem solvers, uh, and uh, this is what we are going to do next week. Yeah, and obviously, uh, Vice President, you have been speaking to the Lord, Lord Frost, and to your team has been working with his team, I'm sure, pretty intensively. Do you have any, um, if, 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 if the Commission gets a reasonable response next week to, to its paper, what is the process after that? Is that just go, does it go into more process, and uh, what sort of time scale do you envisage uh, being followed in trying to address uh, just uh, reaching a conclusion. I have to say that I had a uh, very constructive engagement with uh, Lord Frost uh, over the whole summer. Uh, uh, we agreed uh, that uh, uh, we, will, we will do our utmost to, to create uh, as constructive atmosphere as, as possible. Our team are, uh, I would say, talking uh, to each other um, all the time. And uh, we are in very, very frequent, uh, very frequent uh, uh, contacts. And I think uh, that our response uh, to the to the governmental uh, ministerial statement on the grace period, in testimony to that, also the fact that despite of uh, sometimes very charged atmosphere, we are working on uh, uh, these very important proposals for the next week. It just testifies that we want uh, uh, to really bring additional constructive proposals to the table. So what will uh, follow up to that, of course, once uh, uh, we finalize uh, the work on all these proposals, which is, which, is, which is not easy, I can tell you, it's not easy 
It's very, very hard, intense uh, work where the whole commission, all my colleagues uh, are taking part in. Uh, then uh, um, what we uh, are proposing to our UK partners is that uh, uh, also our proposals uh, will have to be explained in great detail on the technical level. Then we are looking for the early possible uh, date to go through uh, uh, the, the, the proposals of the UK and the EU together uh, with the Lord Frost. I believe that uh, this would happen uh, within, uh, uh, within, within, a, within a, uh, a fortnight. And uh, then I think we will have very intense, uh, intense uh, talks uh, throughout the rest of October and November, and I think it's in the best interest of uh, both of us that we will try to find the, the reasonable solution before the end of the year, early next year, because I think that the situation we are in uh, uh, shouldn't be eternal. I think nobody benefits from that. Uh, it creates uh, 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 political tension. It uh, uh, deprives the, the businesses from uh, benefiting uh, from, the, from the single market, and, and also it uh, consumes enormous political energy on, on, on both sides and, and prevent us from what I hope uh, would be eventually the next stage, uh, how we are going to, to forge the new true post-Brexit, uh, uh, I believe, close uh, partnership uh, between the EU and UK. I think we have enough of the uh, global problems on our table. I mentioned the climate change. Now we are, very, of course, uh, uh, are tackling high energy prices. We have a lot of security concerns uh, uh, to deal with. So that so the agenda for the EU UK is, 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 is pretty important. And I think that uh, we should devote uh, adequate political energy also to, to, to those large global themes. But until we make sure that the problems at hand, which are so sensitive, uh, uh, for the people uh, on the island in the island uh, are set up. Of course, it's very difficult to move uh, uh, to the most uh, more more constructive uh, uh, agenda, which uh, I think it's, uh, it's it's long it's long overdue. So uh, to uh, come back to your to your question, presentation next week, and then intense talk with our UK counterparts on on all levels. Hopefully, with uh, making clear headway. Uh, before the end of the year. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to questions because uh, there's an awful lot of them here. Um, but just one final one. You said uh, there that your relationship with Lord Frost was constructive. You've had a constructive engagement with him over the summer in particular. How surprised are you from time to time with the rhetoric, um, uh, leaving aside the party conference, which may be very particular event, but are you surprised from time to time at the rhetoric that you hear from London, given the state of your, um, the, 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 the relationship that you enjoy with uh, Lord Frost? I understand that uh, uh, we both operate in, uh, in a political uh, environment. And uh, uh, I mean, this, this uh, uh, rhetoric is, um, I would say now uh, part of the political debate uh, in uh, the UK, but my job here is uh, to make sure that we will find uh, the good practical solutions uh, uh, for the people in the Northern Ireland and on the island of Ireland. And so that's my priority. And uh, I am doing my utmost not to be detracted uh, uh, by any political statements, but of course they are creating the, 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 the political uh, atmosphere and uh, the harsher the statements, more difficult it is uh, uh, also for me uh, to do my job, but of course, here we are. We are. We are professionals. We are uh, solution-driven people, and uh, therefore we want to focus on the good proposals, uh, uh, which we can put on the table, and uh, to really deal with with the with the concrete concrete issues. And uh, therefore, we are focusing on on, on that part, uh, which I think uh, is very important, and which can actually deliver a real change uh, for the people uh, in Northern Ireland. Okay, so I'm going to go to some questions now, and um, one here from Steve Aiken, whom you may have met, um, a unionist um, uh, politician, obviously, a member of the Legislative Assembly in Northern Ireland, and Steve as Vice President, uh, now that at least 50% of the population in Northern Ireland believe that the protocol is undermining the Belfast Agreement, and that Strand 3 of the agreement has been completely undermined by the protocol, 
uh, how can the EU legitimately say it is supporting the agreement in all of its parts? If the EU claims that it is a supporter of the agreement, when is it going to give equal weight to all of its parts? They're all his words, of course. Well, thank you very much for uh, for uh, for that question as well. And I think we we, we had a, um, a discussion on this very important and sensitive uh, topic when I was uh, in uh, Northern Ireland, and therefore. Uh, I was very clear also in my meeting with uh, all political leaders that uh, what we want is to have the best possible solution for all communities in Northern Ireland, for all communities. We have uh, uh, no agenda or tackling uh, uh, constitutional ter territorial arrangements of, of, the, of the UK. And uh, uh, I believe uh, if you find uh, the good, uh, practical solutions uh, to, the, to the issues we discussed, uh, also these worries would, would dissipate because uh, there are uh, very often concern between uh, East and uh, uh, East east and West uh, trade. And, and I, I heard uh, the representative of the business community uh, who was explaining to me, uh, look, you know, all my life, I was just doing business between Northern Ireland and GB and GB and Northern Ireland. So I'm not benefiting from the access uh, uh, to the European single market. Maybe in the future, that would be the case, but until now, this is not the case. And I have to face additional uh, uh, problems, which I didn't anticipate uh, just the two years ago. That's a legitimate concern. That's, that's an issue. So let's work on it. Let's solve it. And I think that by um, uh, resolving these, these issues, so a lot of, uh, of, uh, the, the, a lot of concerns, uh, a lot of um, um, worries uh, about how, uh, in what way, uh, this might uh, affect the Good Friday Agreement uh, uh, would be resolved. Because for us, as I said, peace, uh, stability, and, and respect for the Good Friday Agreement is, uh, um, is of tantamount uh, and paramount uh, importance. Therefore, we went uh, for such a length uh, to negotiate uh, on the protocol, it took it took us five years. It was the last thing which was agreed, and we really negotiated the line by line with our uh, with our uh, British British partners. So it was really something which was really looked at from from all the sides, and therefore I think that after five years of the best minds working on this solution, I can say that, that that's the, the best solution we found. It's probably not ideal. But to be quite honest, uh, even in these very intense talks and discussions I had in, um, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, I, haven't, I haven't heard about any alternative. What is the alternative? Definitely it's not the hard border. Uh, definitely it's, it's, uh, it's not just uh, simply uh, 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 getting rid of all, 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 the, all the controls and check which would, which would uh, undermine uh, uh, the access of the uh, Northern Ireland uh, to, to single market. I, I, haven't, I haven't heard the alternative. So what we are trying to do to deliver here is to find uh, the, the solutions uh, which would address uh, the, the, the concern of unionist community. And I had, I had to say, I think already, I think uh, three conversations with Sir Jeffrey, whom I appreciate a lot. And, uh, uh, and I told him that uh, uh, I, I, of course, listened to him very carefully because uh, um, what we need to do is to find a solution which is acceptable for all uh, communities. I, I had, uh, before Sir Jeffrey, I talked to Mr. Putz on several occasions, uh, and I told him, please tell us, come up with, uh, with the solutions, how you would like to, uh, uh, to, to, to organize the checks and controls, because you understand uh, uh, that we need them. And uh, I think they've been very, very important uh, in, uh, in, in the past, when we had uh, the med cow disease, when we had the foot and mouth disease, and I still uh, uh, remember uh, uh, Reverend Paisley saying, you know, why we should uh, uh, decide uh, which cows are uh, Northern Irish or Irish because all cows are Irish. And, and, and the reason he said it was because he wanted to make sure uh, that uh, at that time, uh, Island of Ireland is protected uh, from the from the animal uh, diseases which have been uh, threatening the farmers in Northern Ireland. And you would understand that I think uh, that was proven 
as a, as a system which is working, which is good in, in, in the past, they're talking about public health, they are talking about animal um, plant health. So I think we need to find practical solution, how to guarantee uh, the safety um, uh, to, the, to the people on island, Northern Ireland, and of course, uh, uh, then uh, people on the, on the, on the single, uh, single, uh, single market and not in any way putting in under any question mark and in jeopardy all tenants uh, of, the, of the Good Friday Agreement. So therefore, I think our political line is very clear and where are the question marks? Let's address them, but let's look for that in the practical ways and not only political declarations, how we want to solve them. Okay, I'm going to just, um, there are an enormous number of questions here relating to Article 16, and I'm just going to mention one or two of them, and you can come back to them. Some of it you've already addressed, uh, but uh, a lot of them I have to say, Vice President, based on the clear expectation that the UK will will trigger Article 16. But let me read some of the questions to you. From The Guardian, for example, Lisa O'Carroll, she says, what will your reaction be when Lord Frost announces the UK is going to trigger Article 16? The EU must know that this is now more likely than not and must have game planned its response. And then second part of that question, she says, how concerned are you that the UK will simply stop applying the protocol completely, but claim that it is still in place? That's just one question and maybe one or two more, if I may. Again, a lot from journalists here from BBC Northern Ireland. Uh, what does the UK do if the, what does the EU do if the UK says not good enough to, to, to your response next week, triggers Article 16 and begins to operate the sea border on the basis of the command paper? And then a final question from, again, the BBC. How seriously, do you, Jessica Parker, how seriously do you take UK threats to trigger the Article 16, and when you say there can be no renegotiation, are you ruling out any change to the text or perhaps any additions to the protocol? Well, thank you very much uh, for, for all, all those uh, uh, questions, and um, if you allow me, I will, I will try to address them uh, politically, because I think this is what is required at, at, at this stage. First and foremost, uh, as I said, we've always been approaching the, uh, the, the discussions uh, and our relationship uh, with our uh, UK partners in, in a good phase. So what we are currently working on, uh, we are absolutely convinced uh, that these proposals are addressing the, the, the practical problems and issues which have been uh, raised uh, by uh, stakeholders and representatives of uh, different sectors and different communities uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. Of course, uh, the, the proposals which we are uh, putting on uh, uh, the, the table, hopefully next week, we do not treat them as a take it or leave it proposals. We are just showing that this is the way how we can solve the practical issues which, which are on the table. So we will definitely go uh, through them with our uh, UK partners. And I know that what is very important for them is in the end uh, to arrive uh, at uh, the, the joint solutions and the joint decisions. And I respect that. I respect that what I need is uh, uh, to uh, be uh, clearly in, in a room with our UK partner, uh, partners when there will be the same constructiveness demonstrated from, from, from their side. Uh, what I hear uh, a lot uh, from the Lord was this, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that I should get uh, uh, from my comfort zone, and I'm telling him the same. We both should get from our comfort zone if you want uh, uh, to resolve these issues. And I think that uh, we, are, we are pretty much doing that by really looking at all the, all the, all the issues and practicalities uh, uh, which uh, we know we need, uh, uh, we need to resolve. So I am approaching, I would say, the, the weeks ahead uh, from the perspective of uh, in the intense uh, uh, talks, discussions, uh, common work uh, on, uh, on the joint solution, which I hope uh, we will be then able to jointly present and recommend, of course, uh, uh, to our constituencies. Uh, constituencies uh, for David in the, in the, in the UK, of course, uh, uh, in, in Northern Ireland, and. And uh, as you can imagine, I, I need to work uh, hard to make sure that uh, we have full support of our member states uh, and uh, the European Parliament. So what I want to say is that we are really going at enormous length here. 
I believe, in very forthcoming uh, attitude uh, to our UK partners. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, the, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, package of the practical solutions we are putting on the table would be attractive and uh, for Northern Ireland and, and it would be, I hope, supported uh, by, by majority of, of stakeholders uh, in, in Northern Ireland. And if, uh, despite of uh, all that, on different grounds, and I'm not going to, to speculate about the, the possible uh, reasons, uh, uh, UK uh, decides uh, to go uh, for launching Article 16 or simply disapplying, uh, disapplying the, the protocol, then uh, you would understand, and I can, I can assure you that we will not hesitate to use all options available to us uh, 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 to safeguard the EU interest. Of course, our commitment to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is uh, absolute. Uh, uh, and uh, a key pre prerequisite uh, for this is avoidance of the hard border on the island. But then, of course, we would ex explore all the options which are available to us, be it under this global agreement on the, the trading cooperation agreement. But I hope we shouldn't go down that road. We shouldn't uh, focus uh, too much time on that. Let's solve the problems which are in Northern Ireland linked to the protocol. Let's solve them. And I think that would be the best news uh, for everyone. Excellent. Um, two questions here related to the ECJ, um, European Court of Justice. One indeed from Sir Ivan Rogers, um, the former uh, Principal Private Secretary to uh, the Prime Minister. He wants to know, does the Vice President uh, see any scope for finding any options on governance, which in some fashion address uh, the issues the DUP, the loyalist community, and the right of the Conservative Party have with the role of the CJEU? And uh, this seems to be, according to him, this seems to be the hardest issue. And a similar question from uh, Colm O'Mungoin, who's the deputy foreign editor at Irish Radio Television News. He says, practical issues aside, the UK is also asking for other measures like the removal of the ECJ role in the application of the protocol. Is there any chance of that? Again, Coming back to my, my visit uh, to, to, to uh, Northern Ireland, I spent there, I would say, two full days of uh, discussing the, the practical issues with, uh, as I described earlier, with lots of lots of uh, um, stakeholders coming from different different walks of life. The, the ECJs was mentioned once in this two days discussion because and it was not from business community, it was not from civic society, and it was mentioned once. 99.9% uh, of time and the, and, and, and the questions and the problems I heard being coming from that uh, categories, uh, which I described uh, before. Trade, SPS, uh, medicines, uh, customs, uh, Northern Irish stakeholders being uh, uh, properly heard uh, uh, by the European counterparts. 99.9% of time and 99.9% .9 of questions been coming from 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 these uh, from these uh, from these categories so this is some kind of late addition on something which we uh, agreed uh, upon very very clearly when we've been signing on withdrawal agreement and uh, uh, on uh, the on the, the protocol and uh, therefore if you are talking about the, the, the constructive uh, solutions to the, to the uh, practical problems, uh, uh, I think that doing away with the European Court of Justice is uh, not one of them. And to be quite honest, I find it hard to see how Northern uh, Ireland uh, would stay or would keep the access uh, to the uh, single market without oversight of the uh, European uh, court of justice. Do we want to deprive the people of Northern Ireland for this tremendous opportunity, this huge advantage? Do we want to do that? So uh, that's the best answer I can give you at, uh, at, at this stage. So let's think very, very carefully what we are putting on the table and what kind of price tag this might have for the businesses and for the people in Northern Ireland. 
Excellent. Okay, just two final questions, and then we'll wrap it up um, um, at, at, on the half hour, uh, Vice President. And uh, one is from the Press Association here in Dublin, James Ward. He wants to know, does Mr. Sefcovich believe uh, the protocol has protected Northern Ireland from recent shortages seen elsewhere in the UK? And perhaps the very final question then, um, um, it's at the Conservative Party conference during the week, uh, the UK trade representative made comments relating to the level of Ireland, Northern Ireland trade, of course, which has increased, I think, exponentially, and that somehow that could be construed as a negative. Uh, he, the, the, uh, the, the, the questioner, Aidan Maguire, wants to know, can we get the views of the vice president on these comments? Of course, uh, when when we when we watch the news uh, from uh, from from UK, and uh, there is uh, there is there is there is that clearly uh, difficult uh, uh, difficult uh, moments uh, which the UK government is now uh, trying uh, trying to to assess and. Uh, I think it's uh, for the UK UK government uh, to, to deal here with a uh, with a with a challenge. Uh, I understand uh, that on the island of Ireland the situation is is different. That uh, uh, the the supplies, be of fuel or foodstuffs, are uh, are in um, um, uh, good shape. That uh, uh, everything everything works uh, works fine. And of course, uh, we are we are uh, very happy uh, about it. And I believe that uh, you, uh, that the GB UK will also solve the problems uh, they're faced with uh, uh, faced with uh, uh, right uh, right now. Uh, coming to the second and the third question, I think that uh, also our UK partners. Uh, should be happy if more locally produced products make it to the shelves uh, in uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. It's much better for the, uh, I would say, the local business for creating the jobs, creating the growth. It's much better from the carbon footprint uh, perspective, and I think we should keep that perspective because we are approaching COP26 in in uh, in, in Glasgow uh, very soon. So I think we should, if if there are more locally produced goods on the shelves in, in Northern Ireland, let's be happy about it. I mean, I think it's it's good. It's a sign of a vibrant uh, business uh, uh, farmers uh, community in, in the Northern Ireland who just uh, needed to uh, get uh, the more uh, opportunity. They used it, they grasped it, and let's be, let's be happy for them because I think it's a, it's good uh, uh, for the for the uh, for the for the uh, local economy. And I think uh, that also we see that there are increased uh, uh, volume of, uh, of of trade. That's also the good sign that the, the business communities found ways how to cooperate, how to uh, how to develop the, the new uh, business uh, business opportunities, and and that's actually um, one of the reasons why I believe that tackling the practical solutions. Uh, Link the, with the protocol would be uh, to the benefit uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland uh, uh, business representatives and overall people of uh, Northern Ireland because they would have the access to the to the biggest uh, market in the world. And I think that it would have a very clear secondary positive uh, aspect on uh, the EU UK relations because it would allow us to focus on other. Issues which are equally important. I mean, uh, uh, we are number one uh, trading partner for for UK, if I remember uh, correctly. There are a lot of issues uh, I think we we would like to discuss, uh, to solve, to to move on. Uh, but unless uh, we uh, resolve this very pertinent and uh, sensitive uh, set of issues linked with the uh, implementation of, of the protocol, it's it's very it's very difficult to go. Uh, to that to that next stage. So I think that from all the all the uh, aspects, be it uh, short term, be it long term, be it uh, be it uh, strategic, be it uh, um, uh, from the perspective of the of the of the of the of the new I would say geopolitical situation in the world, we we should have every interest 
to solve the problems which are on the table and to really get back to what I think would be so important to have more strategic approach and outlook to the EU-UK relationship. Vice President, Commissioner, you've been very uh, generous and kind uh, and uh, with your time. Uh, thank you for sharing um, uh, your, your thoughts with us. Uh, we wait with great interest in the evolution of events, particularly um, next week and, and indeed the weeks thereafter. Uh, obviously, uh, very, very challenging times, but we wish you the very best and we look forward to seeing you at the Institute in person at some time, hopefully in the not too distant future. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation and also uh, very much appreciate the high quality of questions and, uh, and the opportunity to share uh, with your esteemed audience our thoughts uh, in the European Union. Thank I you. Very much. I think if we had another hour, we'd still be here. So, but in any event, I think we've covered an enormous amount of ground and thank you for being so generous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.